Hi everyone and welcome back to the Regression and Beyond series. I'm really excited for this next set of videos because we're going to be focusing on some common real world data problems that you might run into. Often uh, you get training in statistics in these kind of hypothetical ideal situations and then you go out into the real world and have to deal with real world data and often that data doesn't look like the nice kind of perfect data that you've been practicing and learning on. So for this first uh, set of videos, I'm going to be focusing on assumption violations. And specifically, we're really focused on residual heteroscedasticity. Uh, we're mainly focused on that one because that's really kind of the big problem in terms of causing problems for us. Uh, specifically, you'll get bias standard errors. And when you have bias standard errors, that in turn means you're going to have biased p-values and you might potentially make an error either rejecting the null hypothesis or failing to reject the null hypothesis uh, inappropriately. So as before, as the, all the other videos, I have the script file and the data file that I'm going to be working through today linked below. <clears throat> and let's get right into it. So at the start, we're going to be doing what we've done in all of these labs. Again, I'd like to use the Rio package to do this, but there's lots of ways you can do it. And remember, again, you do need to specify a specific path for your specific computer you're working on. And you don't have to name this data. You can change that to whatever you want. I just like to keep things very simple. <clears throat> so one of the first things we almost always do is get a look at the descriptive statistics. Basically, just going to get a quick glance. Might want to do more of this in the real world, but for our purposes, it's always a good starting point to look at these. All right, so we have two independent variables, x1, x2, and two dependent variables, y1 and y2. We're going to estimate uh, multiple models today. That's why we have a y1 and a y2. So let's start with what we've done before again and estimate uh, the linear regression model using ordinary least squares regression. And I named it LM1, but you can name it whatever you would like. And then we get the summary and we can look at the output here. So it looks like independent variables all appear to be statistically significantly related to Y1. And we're explaining a little over 70% of the variance. So, so far we might say, hey, it's looking pretty great. But let's have a look at assumptions first. We'll start with visual inspection as we've done before. Residuals versus fitted plot. You'll remember we basically want to see a horizontal line. So that is not looking good, a potential indicator that we're going to have some problems in terms of residual heteroscedasticity. Now looking at normality, so are the residuals normally distributed? Remember for this one, the QQ, what we want to see is that all these little dots follow along the diagonal line. That's what we want to see if it's a perfectly normal distribution. Then we can kind of skip over those others real quick. But already just visually, it looks like we're going to have residual heteroscedasticity. Let's keep on, there's that plot. Normality looks like where it's approximately normal, just based off, off of eyeballing it. But now let's actually get into tests. Uh, if you're just jumping into this video and haven't seen the previous videos, I do cover everything that I've done up to this point in the previous videos in this series. So now we're checking skew and kurtosis of the residuals. Remember, if it's perfectly normal, we'd expect skew to be zero and kurtosis to be three. 
and do that JB test to do a formal test of that. Again, the null hypothesis is that uh, skew is equal to zero and excess kurtosis is equal to zero. So we can retain or fail to reject the null hypothesis. Okay, so that uh, the normality of residuals assumption, that seems like a, a tenable assumption that we can hold. But now let's go check for heteroscedasticity. And here we go, just did the BP test and it is significant. I'll do the multiple versions of the white test. Again, I'm skipping over the full generic version of the white test. Again, you can look at previous videos if you would like uh, to know how to do that and want to do that. But here we can see with both tests, the, the BP is statistically significant and white tests is also significant. So basically we have some clear indications of residual heteroscedasticity. And as I mentioned at the beginning, this is a problem because uh, generally, again, maybe not depending on the circumstances, maybe it's slightly less of a problem, but usually or very often we're interested in doing a hypothesis test, right? And standard errors are going to factor into those tests. So if our standard errors are biased, we get incorrect tests and it causes all sorts of potential problems. Not always, but it can, right? You might be able to to reach one conclusion if you do it this way. And then if you actually addressed it, maybe you'd reach a different uh, conclusion. So as I mentioned, oh, I didn't mention this briefly, but we're focused on residual heteroscedasticity as well, because the normality of residuals actually isn't a, a huge major problem if that's violated, especially if you have a good size sample. The, the bigger problem, or generally one of the main problems, is this heteroscedasticity issue. So that's why we're focused on that, but I'll be talking about normality as well. Notably, these are not the only assumptions for uh, a linear regression model, but we're just focused on some of the, again, some of the main ones. Something like independence uh, of observations, presumably you would know ahead of time right? If you're looking at things like this, tracking people over time, that potentially you're going to have uh, an issue, you'd violate the independence assumption. And we'll be talking about some other uh, different approaches um, with that as we go on in different models, but here just talking about linear regression. And what I'm going to show first is probably, I would say, probably the most common way of addressing this, which is to use um, a heteroscedastic corrected covariance matrix. Always tough to say, HCCM. Uh, they often, for short, go by the name of sandwich estimators. Uh, you might ask why we call them sandwich estimators. Basically, it just gets into the math of the equation. If you actually look up uh, like the equation and matrix and matrix algebra, basically what you get is two slices of bread and then meat in the middle. That's why it's called a sandwich. You can look into that more if you're interested, but you might hear that word come around, sandwich estimator, and say, well, what are you actually talking about? They're talking about a heteroscedastic corrected covariance matrix of which there are actually multiple. So we'll go through them. So first we need to install some new packages, JTools and the sandwich package, notably sandwich package we're going to use for sandwich, uh, <clears throat> sandwich estimators for our standard errors. So go ahead and install those. I have them installed, so I'm not running that, but leave the lines in there so you have it. And this JTools package relies on that sandwich package. So that's why we're installing that, but we're actually just loading J tools. So the reason I'm going to use that, it's a, it's a real nice way to get, uh, for example, a linear regression model. And we want to get broadly what we call these robust standard errors, right? Often called robust, right? Because they're robust to assumption violations, specifically heteroscedasticity. So that's why you'll often hear this term as well. People say robust standard errors. We use a sandwich estimator. Sometimes it can be a little confusing what people actually did. 
uh, but usually it refers to um, one of these. So we're going to use this package, which we can actually uh, request all the different versions of the HC, that matrix I was referring to. You'll see by default, if you just do the robust is true, we get the HC3, but you can specifically request different ones. Again, I'm just showing so that you could. You'll notice if you actually sc scroll through these and look at the standard errors, there's really no difference. Both the independent variables, if we're two decimal places, they all round uh, to the same thing. So really not a dramatic difference. Um, in R, like you just said in there, the, the HC3 is the default. I believe it's the default in uh, most other programs as well. The original one is this HCO. That white name might sound familiar to you because we did the white test and it is actually the same person that uh, helped develop this idea of the uh, heteroscedastic corrected covariance matrix. Um, so I have a few kind of specific details down here, some recommendations. Like I said, generally probably aren't going to go wrong if you use, I made a spelling mistake here, if you use the HC3 um, as a general default. So if you want to look into the ins and outs of all of them, I would encourage you if you're interested to go do that. Basically, the original one is the HCO, and then all the different versions past this just make some sort of uh, modification in different ways to that original HCO. But the HC3 is the, the general uh, default and has been recommended for smaller samples. It actually is possible to, um, I, I kind of touch on that idea of um, violating the independence uh, assumption so that would be a, a common approach and we'll deal with videos a little bit later on multi-level modeling or also called linear mixed effect uh, modeling and using that type of approach is also common to uh, estimate robust standard errors but there we actually use a slight variation so you can actually apply what we did here but you can have it uh, specific to different uh, levels so you would get clustered robust standard errors. Uh, again, we'll be talking about that a little bit later, but just wanted to introduce that. It is relatively, maybe not super common, but if you, um, you know, if the dependence, uh, for example, there was one study that I knew someone did and they had repeated measures, but it was only two. So the same people responding to a measure uh, twice at different points in time. Technically, that's going to violate the independence assumption. But one approach that I've seen before is they'll use uh, linear regression and basically kind of ignore that clustering. But then there is a way to actually get kind of robust or corrected standard errors in that case. And we'll be talking about that more down the line. So you may remember the Stargazer package. And here I'm going to show, again, Stargazer can be really nice when you want to compare models. <clears throat> and last time wasn't a great, uh, last time I illustrated wasn't a great depiction. I think this is a much better uh, version of it. First, just a reminder about some things. So first I have the, um, I'm creating the object here, the our original model. And then the one where we estimated robust standard errors. So you see, I'm defining each of those. And then in Stargazer, I'm saying, okay, I want each of the models and we're getting text, right? And then here is where I'm asking for specific standard errors. You'll remember how we were able to grab things from specific objects before. That's what we're doing here. So from our original model, I want the coefficient table and I'm grabbing the standard error for both of these. So that's all it's doing right there. But just to kind of break that down a little bit about what it's doing. But now it's nice we can actually compare these. And again, we're addressing the standard errors. So the coefficients aren't going to be any different, right? They're the same. But when we look at standard errors, that's when we do see a difference. You know, not a huge um, difference. 
0 0.053 versus 0 0.068. And in this case, you'll see that they're all still statistically significant when we use the robust standard errors. Um, so in this case, your conclusions would be the same, you know, whether you ignored or tried to address that residual heteroscedasticity. So to some extent, you could say, okay, so what's the big deal? It's not a problem. But that's not always going to be the case, especially in a situation if you have a really small sample and small effect sizes, you know, using a robust or non-robust standard error could be a difference in uh, you know, rejecting or failing to reject the null hypothesis. So it can be an actual big deal, even though right here it is not. One quick thing I'll note uh, before I want to end this video and then we'll move on and move to the second part of the lab. But last thing to really emphasize uh, here, estimating robust standard errors, so these sandwich standard errors, in many ways is kind of the recommended default. And the reason is, is because the robust standard errors will be the same as the original standard errors if you don't have severe violated assumptions. So for example, that's why it's become a, a common thing where uh, sometimes I'll often do this with an approach. I think it's always good to inspect the data and check those assumptions. But when you're just running something kind of really quickly, using kind of a robust approach is kind of a really good default. Because again, the results would be uh, the same if there are no issues. And if there is an issue, then you're correcting for it. So it's kind of doing it in one step rather than trying to address others. And we're going to be talking about that a little bit more uh, in the next part of this lab, as well as in future videos. Broadly, it's pretty common to use a default robust approach in these, uh, including the standard errors, but also other robust, robust approaches I'll be talking about generally can be a, a really good default because they're going to match the results if there were no issues. So we'll end this video here and I hope to see you in the next video.